get started, a little bit about me. Um, I'm a software engineer at eBay. I've been there about three years. I'm a tinkerer and a hacker of uh, software and electronic devices. Uh, some people in my office call me a bit of a mad scientist because I will delve out of the world of software and into hardware and even woodwork and metalwork to make something work if I think there's a bit of value in it. Um, you can find me occasionally on GitHub and Twitter as well if you want to check some of that out. Um, okay, so what do I want to talk about today? Um, I'm going to start off with um, a little bit of an introduction to Docker and why you might want to use Docker in your tests. Um, in particular, I'll be talking about uh, an experiment that we did with one of our projects a little while ago to use Docker with um, our integration tests. Um, I'll spend a little bit of time going over how you can integrate that into a Scala project um, and look at some of the lessons that we learned by doing that and some of the ways that we were able to go forward after having done that work. Okay, so I'm going to start off with just a little bit of an introduction to Docker. Who here is familiar with Docker or has used it before? Okay, so there's a good number of you have tried it out. Um, before I get started, I'd like to take a little step back from Docker and talk about virtual machines. So virtual machines are our typical way of working. They're our default units of compute. Um, and they're quite easy enough to work with. They're easy to provision. We've got a nice UI that's based in the cloud that allows us to spin up virtual machines and gives us a choice of OSs um, to run our application on. But it's not quite as happy as all that. They're a little bit slow to provision internally because you've got the, the overhead of spinning up a machine and getting all of the operating system installed. And that happens whether you use the UI or an API the machines can and do disappear. They're not persistent machines. They're just designed as units of compute, which means that when things go down, you've got to take the time to spin things back up again, um, which is not necessarily a cheap thing to do. And also, I'm based in Europe. I'm based in the London office. So a lot of our infrastructure is based over in America. There's a bit of internal connection latency, just where things take time uh, to get going. Um, I mentioned that it's t quite time consuming to set up. Um, this can be doubly complicated or double, doubles up the effect when you want to do something with a third party dependency like a database or a web server, um, especially if it requires a little bit of human interaction to set up. There's a lot of time you have to invest to set up your dependencies and even if you're using a tool like Chef, it can make it quite a tedious thing to do to set it up. And so for us, this is where we bought in Docker. Now, the Docker website describes it as a, an open platform for developers and sysadmins to build and run applications. And in our case, that's exactly what we want to do. We want to use it as a platform to run our dependencies for our application. Um, so the way that we would normally go through this is create an image of our dependencies um, and push those out to a registry for us to be able to use later. It doesn't solve all of our setup issues. There are still steps that we need to put in some manual intervention. Um, but by pushing them out to a registry, it does make them reusable in the way that a VM is not. Um, it makes it much more easily shareable. It means that there's a bit less overhead in terms of what you need to store. Um, and it also means that we can pre-configure things like our databases and our web servers, which can have gigabytes of data stored inside the image without having to pass around uh, an operating system as well. So for us, that was a big win. That was a big reason for us to go down the path of using Docker. Um, so this is all very good. It's all very nice to hear a little bit about why you might want to use Docker. But at some point, I guess you want to hear about our actual example of why we were doing it. So I'd like to introduce you to our feed service. This was a project that uh, I was working on with a team in London uh, a little while ago. And the idea was that we were building an external API that would allow customers to uh, manage their inventory on eBay. So they'd be able to integrate their inventory management system with our feed service and list their items on eBay. 
we wanted to create a programmatic interface to do that. So instead of having to manually create listings or to use a file upload and download, to have some REST interface to do that. And this was where our feed service came in. It would talk to a number of internal APIs and it would have some proprietary dependencies that would facilitate all of that for us. However, it created a little bit of a testing mess. We wanted to isolate our feed service so that when we were testing things, we were just testing the one piece of software that we controlled. We didn't really want to care about the state of our downstream services or our dependencies. We just wanted to decouple ourselves from everything else in our ecosystem. One of the reasons that we wanted to do that was to avoid dependency nightmares. Um, I'm sure many of you will have experienced the case where you're working with a dependency that you don't know how well tested it is. It may be a little bit unreliable. You may be working in a QA environment which is just slow. And all of these lead to long testing times or worse, unreliable tests. And when you've got tests that are slow or unreliable, you stop taking notice of them. So this is why I say we wanted to isolate our service to focus our testing on the one thing which we can control. There were a number of steps which we took to go through this. Um, we had to decompose the framework that we were sitting on to identify the services that we were actually using and stub them out and so that we could run our tests. And I'll talk in a bit more detail about these in a minute. So starting off with decomposing the monolith here. Um, it's quite a common way of working in my experience. How many of you have got experience with working with something where everything is provided in a framework or library that you have to use because that's what the corporate or the business says that's what you have to use? So a few of you. And these can be good or bad depending on how well architected they are. Um, but when it gets bad is when the, the library or the monolith is full of anti-patterns and black magic. Um, and that makes things a little bit difficult if you want to test something. If you're just a developer wanting to bash out some code that's untested, yeah, you can do it. But these monolithic frameworks that are everything is here and it's full of anti-patterns, it can make it very difficult to test. So the first thing we started doing was investing time in identifying the services we're dependent upon. Um, this can be a little bit tricky. It may require the use of debuggers or network sniffers um, because if it, essentially what happens is you end up digging into the code and actually understanding the process that the code goes through in order to call out to these third party services. But the investment is generally worth it in the long run and the reason I say this is first of all you'll achieve the goal of identifying what it is you actually depend on but you'll start to also understand how your framework works and understand the patterns or anti-patterns that are being used inside of that framework. Once you've identified the services that you're using, um, what we did was start to move the configuration of those services out into some easily controllable and versionable configuration. The reason that we did that is we wanted to be able to provide a version of configuration that we could use for either production running of the application or test running of the application um, without having to rebuild or redeploy the whole, uh, the whole binaries. We did this and as part of what we had to do when making this change was to implement or update the clients of these services to use the new configuration. And this was a bit of work. It meant that we had some code which was now local to our application instead of uh, being part of the framework, but it did buy us the, the, the effect that we were after, which was decoupling our application from production for the purpose of running our tests. So at this point, we've now identified the services that we wanted to use and extracted out a configuration so that we can provide test implementations of these services. Now we actually need to get down into the nitty gritty of doing the work. And we need to find out actually what part of these services are we using? What are the APIs of these downstream services that we're calling? What do we expect from them? You could uh, implement a whole downstream service that mimics the thing that you're trying to mock out. 
but there's not much point in doing that. You want to basically just produce something that's as simple and as easy to use as possible. You could do that on top of something like Wiremark or uh, Python's simple HTTP server. The reason you want to keep it simple is so that you can more easily comprehend what's going on. Um, if you've got a really simple mock with just one or two responses per stub that only performs one use case, it's really easy to build up a mental map of what that mock is doing. And when you've got a whole suite of them running together, it's really easy to say, well, these are the mocks that I need to run X use case. It also means that it's quite easy to now keep them versioned. You can keep them in a separate repository or in a repository alongside your main source code. Um, and we then put them in containers so that we could spin them up as and when we needed to run our tests. Finally, we can now actually get down to the business of running our tests. We now know what our dependencies are. We've identified the contracts that we need. We've written stubs for them. Um, and we can write tests that focus purely on testing that the system that we control behaves as we expect it to, regardless of what the downstream services are offering. And we can have stubs that can provide different use cases for varying responses. But the important thing to note here is that we're not testing those downstream services. Um, what we ended up doing was creating a number of different stubs in different Docker images that we could spin up when we need them and uh, just tear them down again when we're finished. And that's all well and great. That's like the 20,000 foot overview of what we did. What I'd like to do now is to spend a little bit of time talking about how we actually did that, to do a little bit of a deep dive into some of the technologies we found that allowed us to implement that. OK, so the first thing you need to do, really, is to put your application into a container, to dockerize your Scala application. Um, the normal Docker flow, many of you will be familiar with it. You create a Docker image, you build it, you push it to the repository, and then every time you want to run it, you pull it down from the registry and put it onto your server. This works, and it perfectly serves most use cases, but there are a couple of problems for us um, with doing this. Now, especially as Scala developers, we like to have things that are statically checked so that you know, we can be sure that things are working as we expect them to. And the Docker file doesn't quite give you that. Um, the file itself is not checked until you actually try and run it. So you might have a typo that gets called at runtime, but at worst, you may find that you've forgotten to put some configuration actually into the Docker file, which you're not going to pick up until you try and run the image. Um, you may also find that the artifact is not quite what you expect to be in there because the build is separate from the building of the Docker image. So you've not really got any guarantee that you're running, for example, the test before building the artifact that you're putting into the image. You've got no real guarantee that you've pulled the code down and you're compiling the latest thing before you put it into the image. Now, you could tie this all together with a shell script, and it would work, and it would do the job, um, but it's a bit of a duct tape solution to this problem. It's still not going to be particularly elegant. There'll be a, li uh, there'll be a lot that you have to maintain outside of your project in order to keep this working. So we looked at, is there a way that we can integrate Docker with SVT? Most of us being Scala developers, I'm guessing we probably use uh, SVT as our build tool here. Um, so we wanted to find something much like this construction kit toy that would allow us to tie the two pieces together. It turns out we could actually find something that would do that. Uh, there's a plugin called SVT Docker. Um, there's a link to GitHub uh, project for it here. Um, and it basically works by replicating the Docker file inside of your SVT project. So it allows you to create a Docker file, create an image based on that file, push your image out to a registry. Um, and this works very well for us to be able to put our application out into uh, a Docker registry. This is how you start to integrate it into your build. I've got a few code slides here. I'm not expecting you to read through and understand every bit of code that I'm presenting here. I think the slides should be available later, but I include them more as an example for completeness than anything. 
And a lot of these code samples are just from the Scala docs for the various projects to give you some idea of how we were using them. Um, here we've got an example of just how we would create a Docker image for our application. Um, so it just means basically you put a image name in Docker statement into your build file and you provide the image name for your application with some good practice like having a latest tag. You make sure that you've got a namespace and a value for the image name and um, it just allows you to then tie up your build to creating your Docker image. So, yeah, yes. Have you also looked at FTA Packer Perf? And I if so, why did you choose a Docker over it? So, I'm actually going to come to that in a minute. Um, in short, yes, we have looked at that as well. Um, we, whenever we're setting up our project to use Docker like this, we'll also provide just some useful valves for ourselves. We quite like depending on assembly to create a fat jar for our application. Um, so we can actually get SBT assembly to tell us where our jar artifact lives when we build it. Um, this means that we don't have to hard code in a string that tells us where our output path is or try and remember to change this also if we change the project name, for example. And there are a couple of other useful things that you may want to put in there. These are just uh, some examples that we commonly use to keep our application image up to date. Um, then when you actually want to come to configure your Docker file, this is the DSL that um, Docker SBT creates for you. It actually looks pretty much like a Docker file configuration. Um, there are a few small changes. Uh, some of the names are slightly different. Um, but otherwise, it pretty much mirrors the Docker DSL. Um, we can also use the variables from before. So, for example, we're copying the artifact based on a variable name rather than uh, having that hard-coded. There are a few other things that we can reference. And because it's all in SBT, we've got access to whatever else SBT has got access to as well. Um, finally, we will also make sure that the Docker task depends on the assembly task. And the reason that we do that is because assembly depends on compile and test. This means that now whenever we build our Docker image, we know that it's always going to be the latest compiled version of the code and that all our tests will have run before creating that image. And then finally, we can push it from the SBT console out into our registry. Um, so just a couple of things that we noticed when we were working on this project. Um, you can also use SBT Native Packager, which the gentleman at the back mentioned. We found that it was not quite uh, what we needed to do this project. We didn't find it as flexible uh, for what we wanted to do. Um, and also on non-Linux environments, you just need to make sure that you start up the Docker machine before you start up SBT. Quite often I found myself in the scenario where I've come to run this. It said, can't connect to the Docker daemon or words to that effect. I've gone, what, what's gone wrong? And I've needed to jump out of SBT, start the Docker machine up, and then jump back into SBT to continue what I was doing. So I include that there just as a reminder, if you're on a Mac, you need to do that. So that's a quick overview of how you can integrate Docker straight into your project. Um, but what I actually wanted to talk about today was uh, integrating your integration tests with Docker. Um, there are a few projects out there which can make this easier, and I'm just going to have a look at some of those um, and show you how we use them to basically help us run our integration tests. So, as I mentioned before, we're looking for a way that we can use Docker images containing stubs to test our application running with clean data in a way where the resource startup is standardized and in a way that doesn't require multiple VMs or network calls to set up. Um, part of our motivation for doing this was we wanted to also decouple ourselves from a QA environment. Um, it can be particularly annoying if you're 90 minutes into an integration test and some other team decides they're now going to deploy to QA. It takes down the server that you depend on and your integration test fails for a completely random reason. 
um, it'd be nice to have some more control over the environment that you're working with. Um, so what do we actually need? We need some way of starting up the stubbed resource containers before all of our tests, um, waiting for the containers and the services that are within them to start, at the end of our tests to stop the containers, um, and ideally we would like some way to automate all of this. I mean, we could run it manually, we could write a shell script to do it, but it would be much nicer if we could automate it. So the first thing that comes to mind here would be using one of the normal Docker orchestration platforms. Uh, for example, Docker Compose or Kubernetes. Has anyone got any experience with trying any of these uh, platforms to orchestrate their images? Okay, has anyone tried that for integration test purposes? Did it work? Was it easy to set up? Yeah. It, it takes a lot of fiddling around to get it just how you want it, doesn't it? Um, and this was what we found as well. Um, and we thought there must be a better way to try and do this. And so we kept looking to see if there was some way that um, basically whether we could orchestrate this from our test code. So the first thing we looked at was using the Docker Java API. Um, and this will work. It will do what you need it to do. Um, but this is a Java API, so it's not really very scale idiomatic. There are some things that you have to do in here, for example, creating callbacks um, that just make it a little bit not nice to use uh, when you're embedded within a Scala project. So we wanted to find out, is there some Scala project that would work for us and allow us to uh, tie this in in a much nicer way to our projects? And we found a couple of projects that looked promising, um, Reactive, Docker, and Tugboat. But at the time that we were looking at this, they hadn't been maintained for more than a year. So um, they were not quite what we were looking for. They also used the Docker REST API directly and didn't have TLS support. So it meant that they didn't support the latest versions of Docker. Um, but when we had a look at the sample code of uh, the for example, Reactive Docker, it's much more like the way that we want to be writing our code. It's uh, just, it reads a lot more like Scala code. There are case classes. You've got nice things like futures in here. Um, and this would be a good end goal for us to get to. But at, at the moment, it wasn't suitable for what we were trying to do. As I mentioned, it had been unmaintained for quite a while. Um, and also, we've got some very specific use cases here, which are to run integration tests. So we don't ne really need the whole power of the Docker REST API to run our application with. We just need a few very specific things. Um, using the Docker Java approach, there are some things that we noticed which weren't quite what we wanted. Um, so if we use before all and after all to control the flow of starting up and stopping containers, it means that there are multiple containers which need to start all of the time, which can make our tests slower. Um, and there's also not a very easy way to check when the resource is up. Um, you can check that the container is running, but not so easy here to check that the resource is running inside of that container. Having um, single start and stop where you've got all of your t uh, containers defined in before all and after all means that if you use something like test only or test quick, you're also going to be spinning up all of the resources that you need, which is again, not so nice. Um, and we also noticed that control C didn't always stop our stub containers, um, which was something that we wanted to avoid. I mean, we don't really want to be going around after stopping a test to kill all of the Docker, sorry to kill all of the Docker images as well. Um, so then we came across a project called Docker IT Scala. And this uses the um, Docker Java library. And it works a little bit differently to the previous example projects that we were having a look at. It can start up resource containers in parallel, and it starts them up only when they're needed, um, which is once the test starts. And it also has a mechanism built in to allow you to wait for the service to be started up. 
so you can actually check that the service inside the container is ready before it starts running the tests. It will also automatically shut down the containers and you can configure it via code or type safe config. So this is looking now exactly like the type of library that we wanted to use for running our integration tests. It doesn't give a completely clean container for every integration test that we're running, but rather it acts on a per suite level. Um, and this was a trade-off that we were willing to accept because it meant that our integration test would not run so slowly because we don't need to start one up every time. Um, and for us, that was a perfectly acceptable trade-off to make. So how does this work? Well, it starts off by defining a resource container. Uh, the resource containers are declared as traits and mixed into tests, and the project comes with a number of sample uh, containers that you can use. Um, let's just have a look at some of the examples. So this is an example of configuring it um, via a trait. You can extend the Docker kit as your base trait and then provide the image name that you want to use for the dependency. You can expose ports. It's all very simple to, uh, to set up. And what's really nice is you can define a ready checker, which will say when this action happens or when this thing is accessible, I consider my service to be ready. In this case, we've got a Neo4j example, so it's saying when I can get a response code on this URL, then I consider myself to be ready. Finally, you just need to add your Docker container into the list of containers. Um, and that's it. That's all you need to do to say my test will need to depend on this container. Um, it's also possible to define this through type safe configuration. Um, it looks quite similar. The, the example here is for Postgres and it's got a ready checker of using a log line. Um, this is just an example list, uh, lifted from the project um, just to illustrate how this could work. Um, if you want to use a type safe config um, example, you still need to define a trait. And this time, you extend Docker kit config as your base trait. Um, and you provide the configuration location that it's being defined in uh, so that you can pull that into your uh, tests. Uh, again, you need to add that Docker container into the list of Docker containers for it to uh, be picked up. And then finally, you just need to make sure that your suite extends the Docker resource that you need. So now we can say, OK, maybe I've got a Mongo spec that requires some Mongo image. I just need to extend that trait. And the library will automatically take care of pulling that down for you and running it for that suite of tests. Um, if you want to run everything, you can just create a class which extends all of the Docker traits that you need for the Docker images you need and it will take care of assuming that all of that is running for you. So this was now exactly what we needed to get our integration test running. Um, we spent a little bit of time now just going about and refactoring our code and getting it to work with this library, and uh, we got some pretty interesting results from it. So we've taken sort of a bit of a deep dive into looking at how we went to uh, achieve that result. I'd like to come back up now and have a look at some of the more sort of business effects of having done that. So the first thing we noticed was we cut our end-to-end -end testing time for our integration tests. Previously, when we were going out to the live QA system, we were taking somewhere in the order of two hours to run our end-to-end -end tests. And we cut that down to 10 minutes by using stud containers. Um, 10 minutes is still by no means a fantastic number, but it's a big improvement on what we did have before. Um, and it also means that we're now not in this situation where we've got developers sitting around waiting for two hours before they can get a result for something. And that also means that we've got confidence in our system, because now we've reduced our test cycle by so much, we can run our tests really quickly and get answers about the changes that we've made. Um, this means that we can make more frequent changes and ultimately, ultimately means that we're more confident in the changes we've made because we can get answers to how it works much more quickly. Um, we've also removed QA environment from our critical path by doing this. Because we know what the contract is for the services that exist in QA and we've stubbed them out, 
we can say, well, as long as our system is behaving according to these contracts, then we should be fine. If we want to run a full-on set of acceptance tests that actually go through and integrate into QA, we can do, but we now don't need to do that on every cycle. We can make that an overnight thing or a twice a day thing that can run asynchronously to the rest of our process. Um, but we can also go further with this. So one thing that we um, didn't initially intend to do with this, but we found out that we can do, is to start taking performance measurements from it. Um, we found that by providing different configurations of system stubs, we could start to mimic different types of environment that our application could encounter. Um, and we could also start to make business decisions from it. Uh, so when we had a look at performance measurements from these stub tests, it we found that we could actually start to create mocks that can simulate or approximate some sort of real world conditions. Um, this does not mean that it replaces our full on load and performance testing and integration with production. But when we ran it on developer machines, we could start to get a sense for how our system was performing. Um, we could also do interesting things like creating uh, stub dependencies that would do something that could mimic uh, a more production-like system. So maybe if you know that you've got a really slow production system, you could delay your request by five seconds uh, so, that, so, so that you're mimicking the amount of time it takes to get to the system. Or maybe you know that some systems get really busy under peak load, start dropping requests. So you could create a stub that drops, ev drops every third request. And you can start to now tie this into your system and see how your system behaves when it encounters in, in situations like this. You can find out what is the resilience of your system, what are the performance characteristics. As I say, this is run on a developer machine, and it's not indicative of how it would run in production, but it, it gives you some sense of what can go on. Um, so we tried creating stubs that we could use to find out how does our system perform when it's stressed? If we create stubs that return instantly with the behavior we expect and we fire thousands and thousands of requests at our system, how does our system behave? What happens if we send in a few requests but have stubs that mimic downstream services that are stressed? How does our system behave and cope with that? The key thing here is we can now start to gather the metrics. You can start to produce charts and gather data and analyze data about how this is running. I've got an example here of um, a chart that we uh, produced, which shows um, it's basically to do with the, f the number of requests that we could handle. Um, there's a horizontal line sort of near the top that shows the hard limit of a downstream service. And the green line that runs up um, to, the, to the horizontal line first shows the amount of data that we could handle before we cross that threshold. And what was interesting for us is we can see that we crossed that threshold at about 50,000 records. Um, we could also, we've also plotted it against time so that we know how quickly we can uh, process that amount of information. Um, but we can now actually start to make more decisions based on this. We can see this is how it behaves under a development system. We can compare that to results from load and performance and other environments. And we can say, well, in, in our case, they were pretty similar. We could see that there were similar patterns appearing. So we can start making business decisions from this. Um, we can think about what are the technical limitations for the product? What do we need to say to our technical integrators if they're going to start using this? Maybe we want to say, well, OK, send in this number of requests, but only do it every so many hours so as not to overload the system. Or maybe we can say, send in all of your data at once, and we'll batch it up and process it for you. Um, we can also start thinking about business policies for the system. And this was something which we completely didn't expect to be able to do when we started off with just stabbing out our uh, dependencies for testing purposes. But it meant that we were now, because we were able to isolate our system and stab out different versions of our, mock, uh, of our mock dependencies, we could think about these sort of things in a way that we weren't able to before. OK. There's been a lot that we've uh, covered in this, in this presentation. I've 
come more or less to the end now, I'd just like to summarise some of the key things that we took from, from this experience. So the first thing is, isolation is key, uh, especially to gathering meaningful test data and keeping testing strategies sane. Um, you want to make sure that you're not testing everything in the world, but only the code that you do control. For us, Docker eased the pain of managing those stud dependencies, especially during integration testing, because it meant that we could control with a lot of detail what dependencies were being uh, used for our specific test cases. Finally, meaningful tests can tell you a lot about the behavior of your system. And you can use those to influence both the architecture and the user experience if they're well designed. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Um, if you've got any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, I've also got some acknowledgments and notes based on uh, that slide, that set of slides. Um, so we were um, just using Apache Bench, I think, and logging the results out into CSV files in this case. Um, it was not a sophisticated setup at all. Um, basically, we ran these on developer machines a number of times, took the average results from those, from those uh, test runs and just plotted those graphs from it. So it took us a little while to get to a point where it had stabilized, but um, we knew pretty early on what our downstream dependencies were going to be. We knew that there were about three or four internal APIs that we needed to call, as well as a couple of proprietary dependencies. So from that point of view, it didn't take us very long to realize that these were the use cases which we needed to think about for our integration tests. Um, when it came to other use cases, like I mentioned at the end, where you want to start thinking about um, gathering performance metrics, those tended to be created more on a as-needed basis rather than something which we uh, continue to maintain and evolve. Um, but the core dependencies just lived alongside our repository and most of the time were implemented as wire mock dependencies. Um, so yes, we do have some third-party dependencies in that system. Um, we actually had to work with a very specific version of that dependency. So um, in this case, it was um, an IBM WebSphere database dependency that had to be at a very specific version because that's what customers were using and we wanted to match it to that. Um, so we basically set it up inside of a Docker image once and then used that base image for, as a platform for all future updates that we wanted to, to run on it. Um, and most of those updates then were just in the form of data updates as opposed to software updates. I hope that sort of answers your question. Thank you.